the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they didn't believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away marveling at what had happened. Won't read the next several verses, but Luke goes on to tell a story about two disciples who were walking to a village called Emmaus. And as they were walking along the road, Jesus came up behind them and they carried on a dialogue for a little while before they realized it was Jesus. Picking up in verse 36, those two disciples came back to Jerusalem. They told the others they had seen Jesus. And it says in verse 36, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do you have doubt in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me. See, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as I have. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I want to share with you for a few minutes this morning about leaving the show me state. For six years, Denise and I lived and studied in the great state of Missouri, the show me state. While we lived there, I asked numerous native Missourians, why is it called the show me state? And I never got the same answer twice. That was before Google existed. Thank heaven for Google. 21 years after we left the show me state, I finally found out why. Next Easter, we're going to explore why Oklahomans are called Sooners and why Indianans are called Hoosiers. But it seems that in the late 19th century, I'm from Missouri meant I am not gullible. I am not easily persuaded. You will have to show me before I'm convinced. In a famous speech, Congressman Willard Duncan Vandiver said, I came from a state that raises corn and cotton, cockleburs and Democrats, and frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri, and you will have to show me. Looks like somebody should have showed bro a mirror. <laughs> Did the man really have no friends in the world to say, you're going out looking like that? You know, when we read the Easter story, I'm not sure we can really appreciate the mood on that first Easter Sunday morning. We read the story with a lot of anticipation. We can't wait for the women to find the stone rolled away. We can't wait for the angels to appear in shining clothing saying, he is not here, he's risen as he said. We can't wait for Peter and John to sprint to the empty tomb and marvel. We can't wait for Jesus to suddenly appear in a locked room and say, peace be with you. But Jesus' followers had no such anticipation when that first Easter Sunday morning broke. The women didn't skip to the tomb, they trudged to the tomb. Clearly, they didn't expect to find Jesus alive, they carried spices to embalm his dead body. Clearly, they didn't expect to find an empty grave, they were worried about how they would roll the stone away. When you take flowers to the cemetery, you don't expect to find the grave open. And if you do, you don't expect there was a resurrection. They came out of respect for tradition. They came without any kind of anticipation that they didn't expect anything except more sorrow. 
as the story unfolds, the stubborn unbelief of the disciples shows that their mood was really no better. They were in a show me state of mind. Show me something good. Show me something I can believe in. Show me some reason to have hope. As I think about churchgoers all around the world today, I wonder how many will come to church with the same mindset as those on the first Easter. I wonder how many will come out of respect for tradition. I wonder how many will come without any real anticipation. I wonder how many will come with a silent longing in their heart. Show me something good. Show me something I can believe in. Show me some reason to have hope. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ show me? I want to share four things very quickly with you on this Easter Sunday morning. What does the resurrection show me? Four quick things. First of all, the resurrection shows me a good reason to explore more. You know, it's not difficult at all to believe that a man called Jesus of Nazareth walked the planet on the first century A.D. There is so much historical evidence for Jesus, some kind of prophet or teacher, that it's hard to imagine that any educated person would deny that he lived. Neither is it difficult to believe that he died on a Roman cross. That was a common fate for rabble-rousers or insurrectionists in Jerusalem. But the resurrection is another matter altogether. The resurrection takes an otherwise plausible story and it kicks it into the category of incredible. The resurrection flies in the face of everything we know about the finality and the cruelty of death. The resurrection doesn't allow us to merely think of Jesus as a man, even one with special healing powers. The claim that Jesus rose from the dead forces us to either ignore Jesus or to explore him more. The resurrection is a reason to explore the meaning of the cross more. It's not hard to believe that a Jewish insurrectionist was crucified on a Roman cross. But if God raised him from the dead three days later, what do we make of his death then? The Easter angel said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has been raised, meaning God has raised him. And if God raised Jesus from the dead, then why did Jesus die in the first place? What was the purpose of the cross? What did his death accomplish? What is the significance to me? The resurrection demands that we explore more. The resurrection is a reason to explore the meaning of the empty tomb more. In Dalada Malagawa, Sri Lanka, a tooth from the first Buddha is enshrined in the temple of tooth. I'm not making that up. When Buddha died, they sent bits of him all over the world. In Shandong, China, Confucius is buried in a cemetery along with 100,000 of his followers. In Medina, Saudi Arabia, Muhammad is buried on the site of the house that he shared with his wife. In Punjab, Pakistan, Guru Nanak, is the founder of the Sikhs, is buried. L. Ron Hubbard was scattered on the Pacific. Joseph Smith is buried in Illinois. Mary Baker Eddy is buried in Massachusetts. Charles Taze Russell is buried in Pittsburgh. Elvis is buried in Memphis. <laughs> in Israel, the Jewish patriarchs are buried in Hebron in the cave of the patriarchs. And King David is buried in Jerusalem. You can visit his grave. They are all dead and buried. But if you go looking for the tomb of Jesus, you will not find it. <laughs> Catholics have enshrined one location and Protestants have enshrined another, but no one knows for sure. Now, I want you to think about this with me. Within days of his resurrection, hundreds of people believed that Jesus was the Son of God 
and the Jewish Messiah. Within weeks, thousands believed. Within a few decades, tens of thousands believed across the whole known world. Within three centuries, Christianity became the state religion of the entire Roman Empire. Does it not strike you as odd that no one bothered to remember where Jesus' tomb was? Why didn't they mark it? Why didn't they dedicate it as hallowed ground? Why didn't they venerate it? Why didn't they worship it? The reason is the tomb was empty. When Peter and John heard that the tomb was empty, they sprinted to see for themselves. They went to explore more. And when they saw it was empty, the tomb meant nothing to them again because Jesus is alive. The empty tomb is just as much a testimony today as it was on that first Easter morning. It is a reason to explore more. The resurrection is a reason to explore the meaning of fulfilled prophecy more. The Easter angel said he is not here. He has been raised from the dead just as he said. Months before Jesus died and rose again, he told the disciples exactly what was going to happen. He told them in Caesarea. He told them on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. Centuries before Jesus, David prophesied, you will not abandon your Holy One to the realm of the dead. You will not let his body see decay. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Centuries before Jesus, Isaiah prophesied, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Not only was Jesus' resurrection a supernatural event, it was a foretold event. God planned it and God carried it out. In fact, in his life and his death and his resurrection, Jesus fulfilled over 350 prophecies that were made about him centuries before he came. That makes Christianity unique in all the world. There is no other religion that has the evidence of fulfilled prophecy. God left us unmistakable markers in history so that we would recognize his son and believe. The resurrection is a reason to explore the apostles' eyewitness testimony more. Jesus' death and resurrection are not written in the Bible as symbols or metaphors of lovely spiritual thoughts. They are reported in the Bible as actual historical events as seen by eyewitnesses. Luke said, I have carefully investigated Jesus And I have written down an orderly account of his life just as I received it from eyewitnesses to him so that you may have assurance about the things that you've been told. Peter said, we did not tell you cleverly invented stories when we told you about the coming of the Lord in power and majesty. We were eyewitnesses to him. John said, we saw him with our own eyes, we heard him with our own ears, we touched him with our own hands, and we testify about him to you. Paul said, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised again on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and then to the twelfth. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still living. And last of all, Paul said, he appeared to me. You know, right here in Luke 24, we have evidence that this is the testimony of eyewitnesses. In Jewish culture, women were not permitted to give testimony in court. Their testimony was not considered credible. And yet all four Gospels record that it was women who first saw Jesus and reported the resurrection. Now why would Jewish men write something that threatened to undermine their astonishing claims unless that's the way it actually went down? Oh, that's good preaching right there. You ever think about that before? All four Gospels 
record the reluctance of the disciples to believe that Jesus really was risen. In fact, in Luke 24, three times they're rebuked for their unbelief. Why would they paint such an unflattering picture of themselves unless that's the way it actually went down? When I tell the story of how Denise and I met, I tell them that I fell head over heels in love with her the day that I saw her. And that's true. And I also tell that she fell head over heels in love with me the same day. She tells a different version. <laughs> like she gave me the hand for two years before she would even talk to me. That's the way it really went down. The resurrection is a reason to explore the apostles' faith more. What would embolden the disciples to defy the Jewish authorities who had just crucified their leader? What would entice a group of nice Jewish boys to alter their Jewish theology and adjust their Jewish customs? What would compel them to liquidate everything and devote the rest of their lives to spreading the news everywhere that Jesus is alive? What could possibly persuade them to be so devoted to their belief in the resurrection that they would face beatings and arrest and even execution? They saw the empty tomb. They saw the risen Lord. They believed the scriptures about him and they left the show me state. Some of you might remember the name Chuck Colson. He was special counsel to President Richard Nixon, and he was the first man to go to jail over the Watergate scandal. In prison, Chuck Coulson became a believer in Jesus, and he went on to found prison fellowship ministries that shares the gospel all around the world in prisons. Chuck Coulson said this about the resurrection. He said, I know that the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. They proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured it if it were not true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. <laughs> You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. The resurrection is a reason to explore the growth and the peculiarity and the perpetuity of the church more. After the disciples began to preach Jesus is alive, the Jewish leaders met to figure out how they could stop them. An esteemed Pharisee named Gamaliel spoke up. He said, leave these men alone. If their movement is of human origin, it will fizzle. But if, is it, if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. Yeah. Beloved, the resurrection was not created by the church. The church was created by the resurrection. 300 years later, Christianity conquered the Roman Empire. 2,000 years later, 2 billion people are celebrating Easter today all around the world. And they're still willing to face death, clinging tenaciously to the truth that Jesus is alive. It's easy to believe that there lived a man called Jesus. It's easy to believe he died on a Roman cross, but the resurrection... That changes everything. It demands we explore more. What does the resurrection show me? Four quick things. A reason to explore more. And second, the resurrection shows me a reason to believe. The New Testament tells us that the resurrection was God's vindication of Jesus. The resurrection proves that Jesus is exactly who he said, God's one and only son, the Jewish Messiah and the savior of the world. Peter said, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Christ. Paul said, Jesus Christ, our Lord, was shown to be the son of God in power through his resurrection from the dead. Mankind condemned Jesus to death, but God overturned the sentence. Mankind found Jesus unworthy, but God has given him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess 
He is Lord. The resurrection assures me that God has accepted Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And my sins have been atoned for. The resurrection assures me that forgiveness is possible. Peace with God is possible. Eternal life is possible. Paul said he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised again to make us righteous. If Christ has not been risen from the dead, then you are still dead in your trespasses and sins and those who have died before us have lost all hope, but Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. The resurrection is proof that I should trust Jesus' promises and carefully heed his warnings. The resurrection proves that there is another life after this life and we don't get any do-overs. The resurrection proves that death is not an end, but a transition. The question is, a transition to what? Either eternal life or endless death. Do you know that Jesus talked about heaven and hell more than anyone else in the Bible? Paul said God commands that people everywhere repent. That means turn to God. For he has set a day when he will judge the world in justice by the man he has appointed, Jesus. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. What does the resurrection show me? Four quick things. A reason to explore more. A reason to believe. Number three, the resurrection shows me a reason to hope. Because of the resurrection, Peter says we now live in hope. Paul said we believe Jesus died and rose again. And so we will rise again too. Jesus is the first of many who will be resurrected. Just like Jesus received a resurrection body, we too will receive a resurrection body if we believe in him. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. Last Easter, my father-in-law just came through quadruple bypass surgery. Denise went up to Toronto to help out a little bit, and when she came home, she said, something's wrong with mom. Her foot was dragging. Her motor skills seemed impaired. By June, we went to a family wedding, and mom was in a wheelchair, and her speech was impaired. In July, we learned that she had a malignant tumor very deep in her brain, and by September, she was home with Jesus. I have to be perfectly honest with you. I don't know how we could handle the loss were it not for the hope of the resurrection. <laughs> Paul said, I don't want you to be uninformed. We grieve, but we don't grieve like people who have no hope. At the end of time, we will be with the Lord and we will be with one another forever. I'm going to be with my mother-in-law forever and I can't wait. <laughs> And not only does the resurrection give me hope for the next life, it gives me hope for this life as well. The resurrection gives me a new beginning here on earth. There's a moment of believing on Jesus. There's a moment when, when we're convinced in the deepest place inside. We might not understand it all. We might have lots of questions. I've been studying this for over 30 years and, and I still have questions. But there's a moment where somewhere in the deepest place inside, we're convinced about him. In that moment, Jesus' experience on the cross and in the resurrection becomes my experience. I am co-crucified with him and I am co-resurrected with him. And that same power that he exerted on Easter Sunday morning when he rose from the grave, it comes inside of me. Freedom from life-controlling habits, peace, joy, emotional stability, mental strength, moral uprightness, confidence, competence, wisdom for living, grace to succeed. It all begins right now. Paul said Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so that we could walk in newness of life. What does the resurrection show me? Four quick things. A reason to explore more. A reason to believe. A reason to hope. And finally, the resurrection shows me a reason to spread the good news. Worship team, you can come help me. 
Once the disciples saw the empty tomb, once they saw the risen Lord and believed the scriptures, once they left the show me state, they devoted the rest of their lives to spreading the good news about Jesus, and rightly so. Someone once said that a man has not really lived until he has found a cause worth dying for. There are many noble causes in the world, but what could possibly be more important than people's eternal destiny? Now we are his witnesses. We pass along the testimony of the first eyewitnesses, and we add to that the testimony of our experience with the Lord. I'm going to close with this thought on Easter Sunday morning. I want everyone to look at me for just one moment, if you would, please. If God truly has sent his one and only son into the world, if this is true, if God planned it and prophesied it and performed it and told us to preach it everywhere, if Jesus really did die on the cross and raise again on the third day, what could possibly be more important than finding out why? If God really has acted in history like this, what could possibly be more important in all of life than discovering what it means? And what could possibly be more important than responding? What could possibly be more important than making sure that the salvation that Jesus secured on the cross has been applied personally to me? Who could look at the cross and the resurrection and simply shrug and go on their way? Well, that was different. Peter wrote, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. In other words, make sure that you're going to make it to heaven. C.S. Lewis said to Christianity, if false is of no importance and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it could never be is moderately important. The first Easter Sunday didn't start out with anticipation. It started out with dead tradition and low expectations. It started out in the show me state. But when they saw the empty tomb and the risen Lord and the fulfilled scriptures, they finally believed. And what about you this Easter Sunday morning? Have you left the show me state? Have you considered the meaning of the cross and the resurrection? Have you believed on Jesus? In just a moment, we're going to close our service. And just before we do, I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer of believing with me. Maybe this Easter Sunday morning is your day to leave the show me state what does the resurrection show me a reason to explore more a reason to believe a reason to hope a reason to spread the good news would you stand on your feet and give Jesus a great big praise this morning